do you reckon happened, Sheriff? How the hell should I know? Hey, boss. One of the boys uh, found this inside. What do you think is on it? Well, by the looks of everything, I see one goddamn fucked up horror picture. You know, um, we, we, like, we like to talk about independent filmmakers quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Tarantino, Dave, David Lynch, in all fairness, mm -hmm. would be independent. Yes, he definitely would. Yes. And it's funny because the film we're about to talk about is directed by a guy who started when he was in his early 20s. And I always enjoy his work. The great thing about him, he's kind of like Lynch. And what I mean by that is he doesn't go commercial. He's very grounded and sticks with very minimal budgets. And, and he should be commended for it. Yeah, he, he, he does some very, and he uses this, uh, the same uh, DP, a uh, very talented DP in a lot of his films, Elliot Rocket. Uh, likes to use Tom Noonan a bit. He, the great um, Tom Noonan. So his name is uh, Ty West, or T West. He's Ty West. But I've been following his career for a bit, and like I said, he doesn't do a lot. I noticed that he's with... done some like TV series and stuff. You know, episodes yeah. of like horror TV series and stuff. You know, a lot of independent directors would go that route because mm -hmm. that way they can feed their family. Yes, because his stuff doesn't make millions of dollars, mm -hmm. and and obviously he doesn't get probably a lot of the back end of that. But give you give you a list of his films, and I'm sure would be uh, you know we, we talk about elevated horror. And they get all these films coming out now, like Hereditary and The Witch and so mm -hmm. forth that are coming out and people are praising. But I honestly think it's because of Ty West that we, you guys have elevated horror, especially with a movie called um, House of the Devil, mm -hmm. um, which I tell, we'll definitely get to sometime. Uh, one of the creepiest performances is by Tom Noonan. Well, he's a good just, actor. You know. just, just, yeah, just a, just a fun film. Uh, just Then he did uh, another one called The Innkeepers. Then he did one called The Sacrament. The Sacrament is what Midsummer wanted to be. This is a much better film. I thought Midsummer was terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this guy did Hereditary, so <laughs> I know that. Yeah, I know. You know how I feel I about that one. I was very disappointed. Um, you know? But he did The Sacrament, which was a story about a uh, man going to find his sister who got trapped in this cult. You know, got addicted to this cult, and they go to get her out, and they film it with you know cameras, and something goes wrong. It's really good, um, like a Blair Witch kind of style, but a little more, you know, uh, what do you call it, professionally shot. Yeah, less raw. Yeah, less raw. And he's just, he's just all this stuff. And he did this one called The Valley of Violence. Mm -hmm. And that was more of a little upgrade. It was a Western, so completely outside of his genre, but still kept it in the scales of lower budget. But it had John Travolta and Ethan Hawke. Mm -hmm. And all it is is about Ethan Hawke going after John Travolta, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's it's just cool. Good Simplistic, versus evil, yeah. Good versus evil story, um, and that's where a lot of his stuff goes. Was good versus evil, um, and it's just he's just a great storyteller, and he's he's a fun actor. He does some stuff too mm -hmm. in, his, in his spare time. And but long story short, we're here to talk about one that just got released. One that the studio backed on, backed up so much that they are already filmed the prequel to this. Yes, Pearl. Now, the Pearl. Yep. The film uh, we're about to talk about is called X. Now it got released in the states. Did okay. I mean, nothing major. It's a horror film. They don't, you know, any kind of money they they make is pretty much profit because this didn't cost too much to make. Mm -hmm. And I just hope this one, and I think it's going to happen. This is going to become a cult hit. Let's just get that out of the bag right now. This a, will be a cult hit. I think it deserves to be. Yeah, it's going to find its audience for people who like Wolf Creek, you know, Blair Witch, Texas Chainsaw, all these independent horror. Well, well, even um, aside from horror, you know, there's a bit of you know boogie nights going on there as well. 
you know? Yeah, it's, it's kind of got a, 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 ma- a mosh of all different genres, and including David Lynch. It had a blue velvet feel, and maybe because blue velvet's in my head. But no, I, I, know, I know what you mean. There's that, yeah. I talk about these characters who are just fucking The nuts mood and, and atmosphere insane. as well, yeah. Yeah, especially with Pearl. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's a fun film. We'll well let's just dive into it and uh hopefully we'll uh get this get this movie a voice and uh more people will see it because it definitely deserves a watch. Mm-hmm. All right. Well where do you start here? Um first first and foremost, uh the one thing this film has for it is the writing. Um it is basically about young people who are going to make a porn in this old couple's farm uh, farmland, and they're going to rent the house that's in their farmland. In the late 70s. Yes, in the late 70s, when porn was real finding his niche. Mm-hmm. And they're actually, you th- you think it would be kind of, it plays a lot like Boogie Nights, and when I'm, you know, like what you were saying there, Trevor, and the reason I say that is because the dialogue's smart. These are people who actually think they're making a really good film. Yeah, it's very funny, actually. Yeah, the, Yeah, they're not there to, just because it's graphic sex and so forth, they they're actually tr- think they're trying they're to make art. <laughs> yeah, they actually think they're trying to make an art house film, mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of gives them the lovability, despite being in a pretty, you know. They're actually quite likable. Um, the, the sort of characters, especially mm-hmm. Bobby Lynn and the producer, I found because uh, sometimes you find, uh, I think, in reality. There's a real obvious. There's an obvious real dark side to the porn industry, and you hear all these horror stories about the treatment, especially in the seventies and stuff. You know uh, of some of the women on set. You know, um, so but th- th- these characters are, are actually they're a bit silly and and they're kind of likable. But there's also um, a few digs at Hollywood. You, you were saying earlier on about Ty West being an independent filmmaker. You know, there's the characters, you know, say things like, you know, screw Hollywood, you know, um, independent filmmaking all the way, that sort of thing. And he, he, these guys are underdogs, and you're, you're as a viewer, you're rooting for them. Yeah, I mean, you should have this, you know, let, let's start off by saying um, <laughs> the first hour of this film, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say it, it, it could play off like softcore porn. Yeah. It's pretty, guys, I'm telling you now. I was shocked at how graphic the sex is in this film. I didn't think it was that bad. Oh, Honestly. When he's, wi- when he's wiping her down from the... Oh, dude, it's pretty graphic. Oh, well, I mean... Uh, what What is wrong with you, Trevor? No, no, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just too desensitized, but, you know, yeah, there's, I mean, uh, I've seen worse. No, it is, guys. If you are not... It's... I'm sorry, it's, it is considered... I would consider... It was tough watching. And not because I'm a prude. Let's get that out of the way. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But it had Brittany Snow, who plays Bobby, who's probably one of the better characters in it. Mm-hmm. And she gets all in it, and she's full, you know, nudity, everything. And I saw this girl as a Disney kid. I you know, it. and she's in the movies Pitch Perfect and all that. Not that I watched Pitch Perfect, but she's in them. Um, yeah. But it was weird seeing her in that. Kudos for her doing it. I'm, I'm she's not very good. She's very good in it. But it was weird seeing her in this kind of role. Scenario. <laughs> Yeah, scenario perfect. We also have Jenny Ortega who plays Lorraine. She's the quiet one. See, we talked about her recently. She was in the new Scream film. Yes, and she um, is the girlfriend of the director. And at first, she well, she she sort of she is a prude at first. Yeah, well, well, she, she, she's not. No, she's not uh, dating Wayne. Wayne is the director. RJ is the guy shooting the film. He's no, the no, DP. we we I, Wayne's the producer, uh, but RJ will be the director. No, RJ would be. Wait a minute, no, wait, no, no. RJ is the one who leaves in the truck. Well, yes, tries to. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. He's a director that's been hired by the producer Wayne. Oh, I thought he was just a DP. No, well, well, I mean, it's never explicitly stated, but that was just the impression I got. Oh, okay. Well, they go to this farmhouse, okay, and it, let, let's start with the opening shot. And I, I've talked in this podcast numerous times about the opening shots. Mm-hmm. We saw obviously the first opening shot with uh, Halloween, the introduction of young Michael. Yes, you know we knew something's we're in for something scary and something fierce. Mm-hmm. Evil Dead did it with a long driveway shot. We always like that establishing shot. This opening shot is gorgeous, and all it is is the camera 
point of view. We're, we're the camera, and we're looking outside a barn, mm-hmm. and we see this cop car coming. Yep. And as the cop car is pulling up in front of the house, we pan closer toward the doors. Then we see multiple cop cars. Like this, something has, ugly has just happened in this house. It is in a great shot to introducing us to the location. And you see a random sort of knife, or is it like a sort of uh, machete-type knife, sort of like cleaver-type thing laying on the ground, and it just automatically, you know, something terrible has happened here. Yeah, and it's one of those things where it kind of reminded me of Texas Chainsaw, where it starts off with the police, mm-hmm. you know, and they're, and they're seeing the cameras and the footage of the different bodies of the grave. Yes. This is the same concept, but it's the actual crime scene we're about to see. Yes. So this is 24 hours um, later. Uh, we jump, yeah, we jump back 24 hours earlier. Uh, it's And it, it, you, you go through all the pretty much the spots where you see, you know, what's about to happen. And it just sets you up for, oh, my God. And what I like about it, because you like these characters that you get you get invested with, you know they're not going to have a good end. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. And you're and rooting so for them. You've, yeah, but you've already set the tension. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? 100%, yep. Yeah. That's I, I just just that opening shot and the introduction we're going to get to the to the, to the team. That's, uh, what is it, uh, Maxine, Lorraine, Bobby, Jackson, Wayne, and RJ. Mm-hmm. Once you're introduced to them, you just have this, this butterflies in your stomach because you know these poor bastards are in for something. Wrong. This isn't going to end well. <laughs> yeah, it is... Phenomenal, and I keep talking about the opening scene, but it it just sets the tone. Perfect. Now, did you catch when they are driving in their van and they go to that market, the the marketplace, Mm -hmm. to pick up you know food and stuff? It looked just like the Sawyer's Market. Yes. Didn't you notice that in the Texas Chainsaw? Oh no, there's so much homage here too. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, even the way it's shot, I'm not sure how he shoots. He shoots a lot of his stuff like 16 millimeter style. I think mm-hmm. that's how they shoot him. Um, well, I think, usually they... I think that was also in a sort of homage to you know the the the, the way the old porns were made back in the 70s and stuff, as well as the sort of more grindhousey type films, uh, exploitation films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and others. Yeah, and even the end credits give you that porn feel. Yeah, and. So when they when the when these poor bastards get there, and they do their yum yum time, the far, the guy who owns it, Howard and Pearl, or the couple that own the farmland, didn't really realize Howard did not know that they were going to make a porn on his farmland. Yeah, um, he gets a little angry. This is where I start getting confused. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, these people start getting slaughtered because of Pearl. And Pearl is the older woman. And she's about 90. She's about 90, exactly. And she's, let me ask you this. And Trevor, I'm asking you, this. she gets really horned up. Yes. And you, the first part, you kind of feel sorry for her. Yes. Because she's older. She's not as attractive. You see some pictures of her when she was younger and prettier. <laughs> yeah. And her husband can't really have sex with her because she he had a heart problem. Yes. So and it's not that he doesn't love her; it's just that's just the way it is. And so she sees this porn being made. She gets really energized and riled up. Yes, and she goes on the bloodbath. There's your story, guys. Yeah, it's basically about a, a horny um, old woman in her late eighties, nineties. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's kind of like riding Miss Daisy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you: when she kills these guys, yes. Like, okay, RJ. Okay, I'm not jumping ahead, but what the hell. Yes. When RJ gets it brutally in the front of the car, Mm -hmm. when she stabs him multiple times, she gets up, starts dancing. Is she getting younger and more powerful? Um, It could be, you know, that that could be read out of it. I I personally don't think so. I think it's just, I don't think, it's not like a superpower, I think, but, um, you know, in her head, um, she she thinks, you know, she's like, she feels almost like she is, you know, like reliving her youth um, type thing. Uh, essentially, um, and it's a great clash, it's a, it's a clash um, about, you know, um, the old and the young. There's a film, of, if you throw away all the porn stuff and all the madness, it's 
basically, and if you want to be a bit sort of pretentious about it, it is arguably a film about the aging process and how as we get older we have these regrets and we wish we were younger, you know? Now, obviously, yeah, I... on, on the surface, there's basically it's basically um, tits and murder, you know? Um, but but if you want to strip it back and really dissect it, this is a film about aging and the, the regrets we have and how we struggle with the aging process. Yeah, I want to see more, and we will be seeing more, because this film has been... Uh, yeah, the yeah, prequel's the, on the way. The pre- prequel's already done. Mm-hmm. And the fun thing I just got was Mia Goth, who plays the lead, Maxine... She actually plays Pearl as well. I did not find I did not know that until after I'd watched the film. Clever how they did that. I couldn't even tell you the difference. Yeah, because they're amazed. in they're in actually very close up scenes together. I mean obviously they would have used body doubles and stuff, but um in those scenes. But yeah, very cleverly done. Brilliant makeup. I did not for a second know that until afterwards. Um I was sort of looking into the film a bit more. Yeah, I had no idea because if you look at IMBD Yes. It doesn't even show Pearl in the credits. Yes, exactly. I was like, what the hell? And then you read it, you read up with the trivia. And then yes. you're like, oh, and then the trailer's on after the film mm-hmm. for Pearl. So, okay, there's a scene in this film. And I'm telling you right now, and I love my horror films, mm-hmm. this scene, no violence, but it is probably one of the most intense horror moments I have seen in a film in a long time. After Maxine... Uh, they're doing their they're doing their yum yum shoot. <laughs> yes, Maxine goes for a walk, and so there's this pier, this little, little broken down dock, and it's like in a like a like a little riverbank, a marsh, a, a marsh of some sort. Yeah, and she decides she's going to go for a little with skinny dip. There's two things that work in this shot, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And if you haven't seen the film, walk away because I don't want to give it out. What the hell? You're listening anyway. <laughs> One first shot is when she's getting all dressed and she's going into the into the into the marsh or the river, whatever it is. You see Pearl slowly coming out of the background, and she comes off. She's got this buff, puffy gray hair, very thinning gray hair, and you see her in the background, and it's almost like a ghost. Yes, it is terrifying to watch. Because you don't right away know who it is because you see the, you think it's a tree moving at first. And then when she comes in and she's still in the background, so she's spying on Maxine, obviously. Mm -hmm. It just gives me chills talking about it. Now, I might have not, I might have got something, you might have got something different on this part. No. But I I I was terrified. But we're not done there yet, right? Mm -hmm. After, and you're still at that moment where she's just staring at her and and from the background, she's going for a swim. And they quickly cut to, on the other side of the marsh, there's a crocodile. Or an alligator. It's an alligator, yeah. It's an alligator. Then the camera pans up. Quiet. You can't hear a thing. No and score. you see her swimming. You just see her swimming. Right near the dock. And what she and then she starts swimming to, back toward the dock. And this is all from camera up above. You see the, the, the alligator swimming closely to her. Walk, you know, about to attack. And she doesn't realize what's happening. Nothing happens to her. Believe it or not, she gets away. She doesn't realize it's in there. And she gets on the dock and she's safe. But guys, it is one of the most intense moments I have watched in a horror film in in a long time. I agree. It is um, a brilliantly um, done scene. Um, You know, they get everything right the way it's done without any score. Um, just that tension of especially I mean I enjoyed the stuff as well with you know Pearl in the woods and stuff but that stuff with the alligator is superb um, you know Hitchcock would be proud of so, stuff like that that is um, yeah it, it's so intense and so oh shit it's gonna get her it's gonna get her um, yeah you know 10 out of 10 for that yeah scene. I mean if you if you just want to Google one scene in a film, this is the one. Well, you can't. I think you can, you got to get into the moment. Yes, yes, yeah. Don't don't watch it. Um, you know, um, alone. You know, on like just that clip on YouTube or whatever. You know, watch the film because yeah, know. yeah. You but because but by this point you're invested in the characters. Yes. So yeah, that ha- that does come along with the scene. So mm-hmm. don't just yeah go to YouTube and check it out. Mm-hmm. Just it's it's such a fun. Well, fun I have scene. always had, even though I've never seen one in real life. I've I've always had since I was a child, 
a, f- a terrible fear of crocodiles and alligators. I mean, these bastard things, they, they, this harks back to, like, dinosaur age, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, with their big mouths and jaws, you know what I mean? That, that's scary shit. You would not catch me for a moment anywhere near um, somewhere like the, the Everglades in Florida or somewhere in Brazil or basically anywhere that has fucking crocodiles or alligators. Uh, I remember watching Live and Let Die whenever I was a kid, and that scene where Roger Moore jumping over the crocodile scared the shit out of me as well. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know how people can live down in New Orleans Crazy or bastards. down in the, yeah. in the Louisiana. Or Australia uh, or somewhere. Yeah, fuck Florida, that. What do you call it? The Everglades in the Florida. Yeah. And they're just house pets to them. <laughs> Never, I ever. <laughs> yeah. I want a dinosaur as a fucking pet. What? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, <laughs> there, there, there's no way. Like, ever. You know? <laughs> now, now, the shot we just talked about, which is breathtaking. We talked about the shot in the opening scene with the barn. This guy just peppers in these beautiful shots. Mm-hmm. There's another one where Wayne first is going there to get the keys to the house. Yes. And he knocks at the door. It's mirror image to when they walked up initially to the screen door in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm-hmm. Even the house is built somewhat the same. Yeah, it's where all... Where the stairs go directly up, yeah. and you can see... It's just it's just a wonderful shot. I'm so glad I've seen this film. I can't... Yeah. I'm, I mean... It's very, very... I mean, overall, it's... Um, I think the first half, you know, the, the first two acts are, are actually stronger than the finale, which goes a bit generic sort of slicer flick. Um, which was, I don't get me wrong, it's still very good and very well done, and a cut above, you know, the rest of most of these types of films. Um, but when I say cut above the rest, you know, pun intended. But um, you know, um, yeah, this is this is very very um, slickly directed. You know, th- this guy Ty West, you know, he he knows what he's doing here. Um, yeah, I thought the sort of the, the final act was just a little disappointing, but only in comparison to what we would got before within this same film. But, yeah, um, generally, I thought it was very, very impressive, you know? It, it's a two-genre film. We kind of yes. You kind of mentioned Boogie Nights, the first act, where you really get these characters and you realize Howard and Pearl are kind of creepy. Mm-hmm. And that builds the tension, all the, from the alligator scene to the barn scene, everything kind of... Even that scene you were talking about where, when Wayne uh, first walks up to the front door and your, your man comes out with a gun, that's quite tense. Yeah. Yeah, and he's an ugly fucker too, man. He's all with his big long head and stuff, and yeah, yeah. all yeah. makeup. Yeah, because uh, the actor doesn't look anything like that, and the, the actor's much younger. Yeah, you talked about it. You know, you like the first act better. What the movie plays like, uh, I, and I mentioned this before in the podcast. It plays like a movie called The Descent. Yes, uh, The Descent yes. is one of my favorites, and Neil Marshall yeah. kind of brought you into this. You were going in watching a horror film, mm-hmm. but by the first act, it wasn't a horror film. You saw this action adventure mm-hmm. about these girls. You know, splunking and stuff that you need to get out of like the, the caves. He did some similar he, with dog soldiers, which I love as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you kind of forget that you're about to see a horror film. Yes. And this is what this does. Well, I didn't I see, and, and the great thing about doing it like that, like Sir Neil Marshall and Ty West and stuff, is uh, for the first hour you, they're setting you, you up with the characters, and you, so then you, you actually care about the characters. You become invested about them. I'm oh, sorry, you become invested with them. Then when the bad shit and the really nasty shit happens to them, it lends so much emotional weight to it. You know. Yeah, exactly. And well, let's talk about before we get into the killings. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the scene where I thought was brilliant, and it's where. RJ's girlfriend, played by Jenny Ortega, she uh, she's Lorraine. She wants to do a porn. Brilliant scene. She's she's very quiet. Yeah, very... she's approved at first, and she doesn't approve of it. Yeah, she's the sound sound girl. Yes, and as she's watching these couple sex scenes in the film, she decides I want to give this a mm-hmm. shot. I want, but she's not doing it because she's a horny tramp or anything like that. Or she she there's a great comment, RJ. He's kind of being a hypocrite now. Yes. Like, no, you can't do this. You you can exploit those girls, but I can't be exploited. That kind of thing. Brilliant scene. Of, uh, but it's brilliant um, set up drama between the two of them, you know. you know. Yes. Yeah. And when RJ gets confronted by Wayne, Wayne goes, you can't sit here and tell her she can't do yeah. this. You know, he and he, he, he sells it to me. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And you see, and, yeah, he's right, you know. And I have to say as well, usually in films like this, and as I was saying earlier on, I'm sure, 
porn directors in real life. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of complete bastards out there. But the sort of flippant in this, uh, where they make Wayne very likeable. He's more like a sort of lovable rogue, Del Boy type. You know, um, if you even know who Del Boy is, it, it's, you know, Del Boy from Only Fools and Horses, where he's just like a wheeler dealer type, you know? Yeah. No, no, I didn't, no, don't know that one. Yeah. And probably neither is half our listening audience. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a very famous UK um, sitcom from the 80s, Only Fools and Horses. But the, the main character was a real wheeler dealer. And I got those vibes from Wayne. Um, and because, you know, Wayne was, um, you know what I mean? He, he was a bit of a, a wannabe entrepreneur, but he was also a bit of a dick as well and a bit silly. But one thing he wasn't, he, was, he wasn't a complete bastard, you know? Yeah, you know, exactly. So and he was likable. He, he, he cared about everyone. They're all friends here. They weren't mm-hmm. there to... So when she does the scene and you see him through the lens when he's, taking, when he's shooting it, it this, this scene is so role reversed. Mm-hmm. So she's in bed sleeping. She said, <laughs> she's sleeping well. Yeah. She just had her yum yum time. Yes. He's in the shower. In the fetal position, cleansing is cleansing himself. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's the woman who's been through something a traumatic experience yep. of some sort is showering her, you know, cleaning herself, and so he's now doing it. It's reversed because mm-hmm. he just witnessed his girlfriend, um, you know, make a porn. Yeah, and he breaks. So down. he, yeah, so he's he's the one this time cleaning himself off and showering, and he's in tears. It's it's a metaphor, but yeah, exactly because it's sort of. Uh, he feels dirty, not her. Yeah. So he, you know, having to wash himself yep. off, you know, yeah, cleanse himself type thing. And then when he leaves, he gets his comeuppance, what we talked about. Yeah. And this is Important where... scene, like... Yeah, this is where they all start getting it. Now, I, I can't wait for the prequel because I'm curious. So we need to know more Pearl's motivation here. I, I, uh, I liked, actually, the lack of um, motivation. We've got, we got a few hints. You no, know, hence that she was bisexual or a lesbian or whatever. Um, yes, um, yes. You know that sort of thing because she's obviously um, very is very much in the Mia Goth's character, the younger Mia Goth character. Maxine. Maxine, yeah, Maxine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so there's, um, you know, and we get sort of glimpses of how she was a bit of a girl back, you know, during you know the sort of post World War One days and stuff, you know, in the nineteen twenties and stuff. So yeah, but I thought it was clever the way. They didn't give us too much. Not like some of these films where it's an exposition dump. You know, it's an overload. This is just a few hints, um, and then we'll find out more in the prequel. But it's, yeah, very well done. Again. And and I read this one, and I didn't catch it, obviously, but I had to look it up. Mm-hmm. Did he? Did he? Did you see all the foreshadowing that was in this? Yes, there's loads of it. So yeah, is. they 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 give away how they're each one's going to die. It's so cool. Now we I we probably both read this on IMBD. So well, once it, it, once was... once we, although I missed, apparently there's a poster whenever the go to this shop on the way in that has a, a film poster, um, of a girl getting that by a crocodile or an alligator. It's uh, your strip club. Yes, right, right. Uh, now I did miss that, but however, what I would say in my defence is that as soon as you know in the earlier scene, which was discussed with the alligator, although me off, you know, um, Maxine doesn't get killed bad i just knew straight away there is no way they're going to put a fucking alligator in this if someone doesn't get killed bad later on yeah yeah there had to be i would be disappointed if it didn't oh yeah you needed it and uh and she gets it unfortunately yeah well Um, well, it's not vaccine it's um what do you call the other one what do you call the blonde one bobby lynn Bobby, Bobby, yeah, Bobby gets it, and that's because. And here, here we talked about the likability. We will talk about that scene mm-hmm. where Bobby is actually going to help Pearl. Yes, she's mm-hmm. just she thought she was going to drown or she was going to yep. jump in mm-hmm. or whatever, and so she was was trying to help her, and then she goes, "Oh, fine, get away from me." Okay, fine, you crazy woman, or whatever. Yeah, and then she pushes her in, and obviously she meets her demise. But again, they were just trying to help. They were good they kids. Trying, they, they were good they kids. Weren't. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's just, it's just, it's, guys. I can't, we can't, I can't really. We're not doing this justice by, by kind of describing. It. You just gotta, you just gotta go watch gotta, it. Yeah, go watch it and just really get into these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like the way it's very cleverly. You know, the final girl um, is not a virgin and she's not a good girl. I, I, I say good girl in the sort of classic sense, where you know the way the classic sort of final girl. And slicer films, you know, doesn't drink. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm talking here like Randy from Scream. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> um, it's funny, but yeah. to flip that because the final girl is not a good girl, you know. Well, they do flip it because you think Jenny Ortega, who's kind of the coming of the newer actress, yes. kind of starting, 
you know, the flavor of the week, I guess you could say, in Hollywood. Yeah. She was the virgin. Yes. So y'all thought the whole time she's getting away. That's a given. Yeah. But once she, you know, decides to give in to her temptations, yeah, exactly. yeah. she gets her face blown off. It's horrible. Well, yeah, so in a way the film also sort of, it plays up to those old sort of tropes where, you know, if you have sex, you're sort of get killed. And she does. However, it's, you know, the porn star girl, you know, uh, Maxine, who becomes the final girl. Yeah. And I like, and I love what happens with Pearl. Confrontation between Maxine, and she's got, you know, the, the what do they call it, the, uh, the six shooter. Yes. And then you've got the shotgun, which she's got a bullet left, Pearl, and they're right in front of each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Maxine's the shooter, and the gun's empty. You're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. But when Pearl shoots the shotgun, she's too old. Yeah, and she can't handle the the, the weapon. The buckshot it blows thing. her. Yeah, yeah, it blows her back. Yeah, the discharge goes, sort of thing. And she just goes flying. Yeah, and she's hurt. And then Maxine just gets in the car and runs over her head. And it's it's seen in the most explicit of terms, you know, the most <laughs> gruesome of terms. Yeah, it's a cool scene. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a payoff. Awesome scene. It's a, it's a catharsis after what we've been through, you know. But that's what I really makes it for me because you're right. You're watching the first act. Like, I'm really kind of liking this. Yeah, how to make a porn kind of film. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's quirky and it's fun and it's you know they're, 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 you, you kind of think that these characters. Well, you know what? They're dicks and they're a bit silly, but I kind of like them. You know, you know. Um, the, the, well, I'm more. Than, you know, I thought they were very likable. They were just a bit daft. You know. Yeah, of course they were. They're just kids being kids or naive, whatever, yeah. whatever you want and, to call it. And even it, Wayne, but... who was a bit older, he was probably like maybe in his early forties or whatever. You know that sort of thing. Even he, as we discussed, even he was like a, you know, he wasn't a sleazy bastard. He wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't bad to them or anything. You know, he, he, was, he was like, yeah, he was the Burt Reynolds of the group. He was just trying really... to make money. You know, what yeah, I mean? if you, yeah, it, 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 I, I just, I can't. Emphasize us enough, guys. See this film. This is one of the. This is a horror gold. If you like horror films at all, especially Last House on the Left, The Hills Have Eyes, all that grindhouse kind of horror back in the seventies. It pays I can't, homage to them. Uh, yeah, I can't. And not to mention the shots we've talked about. Just to just to just to see it, but do these shots justice by watching the whole film, because it just I don't think they'll work. As you know, um, um, Kieran, we've discussed it many times on this podcast. Um, as I've grown older. I have become less of a fan of slicer type films. I'm more of a fan of elevated horror, as you would call it. But um, yeah, th- although this is technically a slicer film, it's very you know it's almost like the the perfect um, sort of uh, fusing of elevated horror and slicer horror. Yeah, I I'd give you that. I give you that. Yeah. Uh, very um, impressive. Yeah, this guy knows what he's doing, yes. and. Kudos, kudos to Ty West and the team for creating just this is going into my collection. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to to own it. Um, and even and, uh, and even though as well, there is it deals with like sex and complete gore and violence and all, and the most brutal of terms. It doesn't uh, once ever feel cheap or nasty. Yeah, or or even it, sleazy. You know, I know. I I I, I mentioned the, is, the I mentioned the Britney Snow thing yeah, just because I watched her as when she was younger and stuff. So it's kind of weird seeing her in that kind of well. See, I, I I position. you know I can't remember her in those types of you know previous roles or whatever. You know, but you know, obviously she, she's a, like an adult now or whatever. You know, so but yeah, yeah, so I didn't get that. But I think just overall, I did not get any. In no way did this, and, and trust me, the the violence is extreme, um, and so is the gore, and there's some some pretty hardcore sex there. But not once did I feel dirty, like I needed to uh, take a shower. Uh, I knew, you know, it, there's a certain sort of tongue and cheekness about it overall as well. So yeah, it not in any way felt nasty or cheap to me. Yeah, of course. And Kid Cuddy, who plays Jackson, mm-hmm. he's 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 a known. Uh... Young, you started off in a young, younger film. Jenny Ortega, same. He was in Bill so, Head Face the Music a year or two yeah. ago, which is absolutely yeah. awful, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's a bad movie. Yeah. Um, but, he, you know, it, if you just accept it, what it, it's just, guys, I can't... It's one of those things I just can't describe. It's made, it's made with an obvious... There's obvious an obvious love of the, you know, the types of, you know, Grindhouse sort of subgenre that it's, um, you know, paying homage to. There's an obvious lo- love there for this, these types of films from Ty West, and you know what I mean? You can see it within this film. You know? Yeah, no, it is. And it comes guys, across. check 
Uh, exactly. And check out Ty West, guys. If you don't get anything out of this, also check. If you don't get anything else, if you get anything else out of this, check out Ty West films in general. Yeah. If you like this, you will love House of the Devil mm-hmm. and The Innkeepers. Uh, just little hidden gems that people need to see. All right, that's a wrap on this one. Uh, very fun to do this one. Yep. We keep saying we're going to not do horror for a while, but fuck it. <laughs> that's just... We have we always we always could fall back on their roots, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's not broken. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, having another stellar week, and do us a favor. We just did weird science there for a, uh, a listener of ours. So if you guys want us to, you know, uh, review something for you, give us a shout on Facebook or on Instagram at Citizen Frame underscore podcast. Trevor, the new issue of Phantasmagoria, is that out or what's no, going no, on? No, no, it's um, going to be coming out um, actually around mid-May now. And um, then we're going to have an official launch at um, the ChillerCon um, convention in Scarborough, which is um, it begins on the 26th of May over that weekend. So, um, yeah, so it's coming soon um, regardless. And it's, it's a Brian Lumley special. So look out for that. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. And that then that comes on... Uh, Amazon. Yes, it'll be available from Amazon and the Forbidden Planet stores in Belfast and London. Perfect. And another massive shout out to Adrian Baldwin, who's been kind of doing some of our graphics for us Absolutely. here and there. Yes. Um, we're, we could keep bothering him as he keeps uh, yes. doing tweaks on our logo. A really, yeah, <laughs> a yeah. real professional logo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and check out um, Adrian's. Um, works as well adrian is also a writer of dark comedy and his novels um such as uh, barnacle brat stanley mcleod must die and the snowman and the scarecrow and his actual recent novella devil's acre they're all available throughout the world from amazon so yeah adrian's a fun writer so check him out too there you go uh listen guys thanks for listening and uh we'll be back uh so we apologize for that (laughs) yep (laughs) We got, we got we got to slam you know I always I always seem to slam us I don't know why uh, uh, we're just you know you know we're humble you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's fake yeah. it's fake humility you know? yeah yeah uh, all right guys take care of yourselves all the best. <laughs>